Okay, so um, hello also from my side. So as my uh, my dad introduced uh, me, I am uh, Tanya Bagar. Uh, I live here in Slovenia and I am primarily an independent researcher of the endocannabinoid system and the role of function uh, functioning of uh, cannabinoids. Um, but I work as a uh, head of research and development at uh, uh, company Brekmoria, where I lead a lab, and uh, I also lecture microbiology at the uh, faculty, and I do many other things. Um, so the aim of my talk today is to introduce um, the field of using hemp and cannabis in a medicine. And uh, I'm going to try to introduce uh, the endocannabinoid system, which is the reason why we can talk about the use of cannabis in medicine in the first place. Without this system, it would be completely useless to us. So as an introductory talk, I will try to introduce the system in our body, its role, and what it's all about. So I will start my talk by explaining a little bit uh, a few basic ideas about signaling in our bodies. So uh, endocannabinoid system is a signaling system so that we have an idea about, uh, of what we are talking about. Um, so I, I've been fascinated with cells and signaling systems all my life and I studied microbiology in the undergraduate studies and for my uh, postgraduate studies I studied biomedicine. I specialized in uh, molecular biology and biochemistry and I uh, listened to numerous talks at the faculty uh, of uh, biotechnology and medicine about sig cell signaling, tens of God knows how many hours. And interestingly enough, nobody ever mentioned the endocannabinoid system. Not one professor ever mentioned the end endocannabinoid system. We talked about molecular structures of each and every cellular receptor and nobody ever mentioned CB1 or CB2 receptors ever. So luckily I was curious enough that I found them later myself. So, uh, and I was really fascinated to find a system that is really complex in our body and really uh, one, of the, one of the top signaling systems in our body that regulate practically every system and every cell in our body Today, every single cell that has been analyzed in our body has CBD1 or two receptors. So every single cell in our body is governed by the endocannabinoid system, about which one nobody teaches. Maybe, I don't know, is it ignorance or is it something else? So um, now let's talk about uh, a little bit about the signaling itself in the body. So what does it do? Uh, so we have numerous signaling systems in our bodies and their, pri their primary role is to, for the cells to communicate with each other so that the cells communicate, that the tissues, that the organs communicate to each other so that when we decide we want to pick up a pencil that our decision in the brain communicates to the hand that it tells the muscles, yes, pick up the pencil. So the signal has to travel. And we have many, many signaling pathways in our bodies, and endocannabinoid system is one of them. So this is just to depict what, what the signaling system is meant to do in our body so that one cell and the other coordinate their action and can produce a functional body. Um, another important thing to remember is that our bodies are aimed um, at homeostate, um, our bodies function, our cells as a unit, our organs as unit, our tissues are as units, and our whole body is aimed to function at a certain level of homeostasis. So um, our bodies and our cells and our tissues, um, they're very dynamic in nature. Uh, biochemically, there's always something going on. There's always tens of thousands of processes and chem chemical reactions happening at the same time. But uh, it needs to be within a certain range, and this is called homeostasis. The cells and the tissues and the organs don't like it or react very rapidly to, uh, to, to uh, big changes in their bodies. And this is called homeostasis, that you remain, let's say, 
uh, one good example is everyone is talking about our body being uh, uh, our bodies being uh, acidic and that we all have to alkalize and blah 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 but then uh, it's interesting to note that um, in our blood uh, the pH value is very 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 tightly regulated if a pH level um, so you have it from uh, 0 to uh, 14 and is the scale of pH and if the level of pH in our blood changes by 0 0.2, we will die. Uh, cells are a little bit more uh, flexible about pH. They allow a little bit higher range. But let's say a, a, a single cell has developed about 25 different systems that regulate just the pH level. They have buffering molecules, several different bu buffering molecules. They have ion channels that pump out the uh, ex ex excess protons in the cell. They have numerous systems that regulate just this one process. So this is just to illustrate that it's really, really important for the cells and for the systems and for our body to remain within a certain limit so that it can function normally. And this is what uh, all the cell signaling systems, uh, this is one of their main roles in our bodies. Uh, another really important role is that I touched already briefly is that the cells, need, uh, the cells themselves need to communicate with each other. The cells need to communicate uh, between tissues, between organs, between every system in the body. <clears throat> and this is also actually the role of the signaling system. And then, of course, um, it's really important for the cells and for our body, for its survival, to be able to, um, to uh, notice and respond to changes in their environment. So in order for a cell or an organism to survive, it has to know what is going on in their environment. So the cells, in order to be able to do that, they obviously don't have any eyes and ears, so, but they develop uh, cellular uh, receptors and they have tons and tons of cellular receptors that uh, respond to very different changes. Some sense uh, temperature changes, some sense ion changes, some pH levels, everything. So the, cells all, the cell always knows what is going on outside of it. And then when the uh, certain change in the environment is uh, noticed, received, then a certain reaction happens in the cell to accommodate and to adjust to this, um, to this uh, changes in the environment. Uh, it has been noticed that naturally signaling systems are uh, uh, an, uh, a, five, a pivotal role they play in every uh, every de development in our bodies, in immunity, in cell repair, in everything that needs swift communication with the environment and fast responses of the body. You can imagine what would happen with our immune system if it would take an immune cell, I don't know, five hours to notice that it, uh, that it has a virus around it. It wouldn't be very efficient. So this, uh, this image is to, uh, just to illustrate um, what kind of complex systems we have we are dealing with when we're talking about signaling and this is just one signaling pathway in one cell at the same time there are ten thousands of these kinds of signaling pathways happening in the cell and this is all happening simultaneously and it's all happening in every cell and then every cell with ten thousand times of these signaling communicates with every other cell so that they all know what's going on in the rest of the body so this is just to give you an idea of what, what the signaling systems are all about and that it's a really complex system in the body. Um, so this is, um, this is if we would take just the membrane part of the cell and the signal, uh, just the mem uh, membrane part of the signaling system where all the receptors are. So this on top are different receptors and these are just a few, maybe this is 1% of all the receptors that are on the cell surface. And they're all, um, uh, the role of all of them is to sense changes in the environment. Um, and then when a certain um, ligand or certain, uh, this, uh, a good example of this is uh, if you want your pancreas to function really well, it has to know what, uh, how much sugar you have in your uh, blood system or in your blood vessels, so it, it knows how much insulin it has to secrete. So um, let's say pancreas uh, has uh, Langerhans islands, 
which have receptors for uh, glucose, and they bind, and uh, according to how many molecules of glucose binds, that's how much insulin you start pumping up. And so every time a receptor becomes active, a certain change happens in the cell. Uh, usually a biochemical cascade of reaction happens, and a certain gene uh, starts being transcribed or stops being transcribed, something happens in the, so this would be the nucleus, and these are our genes. Um, usually majority of changes happen um, after the receptor is activated, uh, the signal travels to the uh, cell nucleus, and certain um, changes in transcription of genes happen, and these are the responses that when, then we notice on, um, in our bodies. Okay, so this was just to give you a brief idea of what we're talking about, and now let's start talking about the cannabinoid system, or our internal cannabinoid system, meaning endocannabinoid system. So as we, were, uh, as we saw before, there are these receptors in the cellular membrane, and one of these receptors are cannabinoid receptors. And to date, we are sure that we have two CB1 and CB2 receptors, although I'm pretty sure we'll find many more. But so far, we know we have the CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, and this is about how they look. Uh, they are always spanning the membrane, so one piece of the receptor is on the outside of the cell and the other piece of the receptor is on the inside of the cell. And this is what, in, uh, what enables these receptors to sense the changes in the outside of the neurons and then bring the signal into the neurons so the neuron can react. Okay, and so far um, we know of uh, several ligands that we uh, have in our bodies that bind to these receptors. Uh, they're called, called endocannabinoids. And uh, the first time I ever talked about uh, endocannabinoids and them binding to our receptors, the first question I got after my talk was, so does that mean that our body has the ability to get itself high? I said, well, if, if you put it like that, basically, yeah. yeah. So, um, our bodies are very smart in many ways that they do, and they, um, let's say the endocannabinoid system is a very evolutionary, um, evolutionary, very old system that all vertebrates have it already, and there's a perfectly good reason it's there. And it's, there's a perfectly good reason why it's doing what it's doing. So we, uh, we know uh, two ligands, two endocannabinoids have been studied really well. Uh, the first is an endomite and 2-AG. Uh, the first uh, binds the CB1 receptor and the second binds the CB2 receptors. Um, so this is the basic, what uh, our endocannabinoid system is, what we know for sure is made of these two types of receptors and these two types of uh, endocannabinoids. But as I mentioned uh, already with receptors, I'm sure uh, the system is way more complex than that. I'm sure we'll find many more receptors and many more uh, ligands that we produce. But um, the story is naturally more complicated than this. It has already been established that our endocannabinoids bind not only the CB1 and CB2 receptors, but they activate many other receptors in our bodies as well. And then there's also the relationship between uh, our endocannabinoids and also other cannabinoids we get, let's say, from hemp, that uh, there's a huge difference in, uh, difference in the reaction of our body if we just take one cannabinoid or two or three or 110. And what happens in our body and which receptors get activated, there's a huge difference in responses of our body and our endocannabinoid system. So, we're dealing with quite a complex system. So um, the basic of our endocannabinoid system are these two receptors. And uh, the reason that they function very differently, the reason that we have very different effects if we activate CB1 receptor or activate CB2 receptors is uh, where they're located. So they're located very differently. Um, they're very differently distributed throughout the body. And the uh, CB1 receptor is uh, mainly found in the central nervous system. 
this is the single most abundant receptor in our brain and in our uh, otherwise in our central nervous system. The most the most abundant of all. If we go um, if we isolate all the receptors, by far we get the most CB, uh, CB1 receptor in our central nervous system. And this is also the receptor to which THC binds. He is very famous. So, um, because its uh, um, receptors are located uh, in the central nervous system, this is also why it has the effects that it does. But nonetheless, it's uh, not located just in the central nervous system, but also in many um, endocrinal um, systems. So it's uh, located also in the pituitary gland, thyroid gland, and also adrenal gland. Um, it has been found on uh, cells that regulate metabolism and energy uptake. Uh, it has been found in muscle cells, liver cells, fat cells, and in uh, digestive tract. It has recently also been found in lung cells and kidney cells. And um, in uh, males, it, it, has been highly con uh, it has been found to be highly concentrated in prostate and sperm cells and with women in ovaries and uh, placenta. So, um, okay, the central system is important, but just be aware that there, the receptors for um, the receptor CD1 is found in many other vital parts of our bodies. And then there's CD2 receptor. This one is located, uh, it's not so heavily concentrated in just one part of the body, but it's more uh, evenly distributed to, to our body, but the highest concentration has been found in the peripheral tissues of the immune system. It has been found on the majority of our immune uh, organs, such as spleen, tonsils, thymus glands, and it has also been found on the, uh, on the surface of majority of immune cells. So this explains why CB2 uh, receptors and its activation through CBD cannot um, Cannabidiol uh, is very immunostimulatory and immunomodulatory. Um, CB2 receptor is also found in the brain, but not nearly as densely uh, as CB1, and it's also located on different cells. Uh, CB1 is primarily on uh, neurons, and CB2 is primarily on microglia, microglial cells, which are like immune cells for the brain. Um, and then CB2 is also uh, found uh, in uh, gastrointestinal system and in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, nervous system. Um, here, um, um, they're sure, we are sure that it's found in the peripheral nervous system, but uh, not exactly the type of cells on which it's found. So, as, uh, as though it may sound like we know really a lot about it, which we do, there are still many things that uh, need to be discovered what, uh, when we're talking about the endocannabinoid system. So now we know we have in our bodies at least these two receptors, so how can we activate them? So we touched already on uh, the endocannabinoids, which we make ourselves, and they regulate processes in our own bodies. And then, of course, you can get synthetic ones, which uh, um, now we can already get in Slovenia prescription-wise, but uh, um, nature is much wiser than chemists, so I'm, um, I'm, I'll just mention that they exist, but I won't waste much time on them. And then there are, of course, uh, plant-derived uh, phytocannabinoids, and hemp is the best source naturally, whereas it's good to know that also other plants produce cannabinoids, but nobody's making such a fuss about them. Let's say America, what's it called? <coughs> now this one also contains cannabinoids, and nobody's making a fuss about it. But hemp, Lord forbid. So, <coughs> So it has these two, which one, uh, the ones that are most uh, well known, so it's THC that binds to um, CB1 receptor and the cannabidiol that binds to CB2 receptors. And these, uh, the two of them have been most well studied uh, as far as the effects on the body 
uh, and what the activation of different receptors does for our bodies. Um, now I will just briefly touch on what happens when these receptors get activated. For the body, it's generally, um, it doesn't make huge difference whether an endogenous and a cannabinoid activates receptor or you get it through an outside source, let's say extracts of uh, hemp or um, extracts of uh, echinacea. It doesn't make a difference for the body. The same reaction follows. Um, so this is, um, this is a close-up of what it looks like in our neuronal system. So the one on the top is, uh, uh, is a neuron and a, uh, on, uh, this bottom bit is also the neuron and this in between is the neuronal cleft and this is where all the action is going on. And so the, um, the endocannabinoid system uh, has been uh, a bit late uh, discovered in comparison to other signaling systems. And there's one reason, because nobody looked at the right membranes. Um, usually when a, a signaling pathways in neurons are studied, you always look at this bottom membrane because you think that the signals are always traveling downstream. And you always look at what's happening in the uh, uh, s uh, lower membrane and try to find uh, receptors and signaling molecules there. But of course, this. Uh, cannabinoid and the endocannabinoid system is a bit different. The receptors are not found on the bottom membrane, but on the upper membrane. And this is why it took 20 years to discover them, because just nobody looked on the other membrane. Um, and when they finally did, they found an abundance of uh, CB1 and CB2 receptors on this upper membrane. And the reason is that it's not meant, um, it's meant as a, a regulatory system. It's meant um, the, the main role that has been found for the endocannabinoid system is that it functions as an SOS mechanism in the body that is aimed to protect the body. And so when the, um, the bottom cell realizes that it's getting way too many signaling molecules, it starts to produce endocannabinoid and signals to the upper one that there's too much signals and slow down. And that's why it's sending signals upstream, not downstream. And this is the reason we found it so late. Um, and so when this cell realizes this lower uh, bottom cell downstream signaling, realizes that there's way too much signaling molecules here in the cleft, it starts to produce either 2-AG or anandamide. And this one binds to the upper molecule, and it tells the upper neuron to slow down the secretion of ex uh, excitatory um, uh, neurotransmitters. And this is why the nervous system then uh, cools down. And this, is, um, this has been found in the, um, in the neurons to be the primary role, that it protects neurons from being overexcited. Because when neurons produce way too many uh, signaling molecules, they burn. They just um, they destroy themselves if they don't have a mechanism to stop this uh, excessive excretion of uh, molecules. Um, I love these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's nice>. <laughs> <laughs> no, now they're from published papers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're not mine, unfortunately. Maybe some soon. Um, so uh, this is uh, to give you an idea what happens then inside of the cell once uh, a receptor is activated and the, uh, either endocannabinoids or phytocannabinoids bind to these receptors. The yellow thing that looks like this is the one that is the actual CB cannabinoid receptor. And when this one gets activated, a ton of processes start, start to happen in our bodies, in our cells. And the reactions are uh, all not uh, always the same. Different things can happen. Uh, which uh, here I just listed a few that have been found uh, that are for sure. Uh, so um, let's say um, the um, extracts from um, um, hemp and cannabis have been uh, have become very famous. Uh, 
for their putative or maybe not so putative uh, anti-cancerogen uh, qualities. And this is just one case that proves or argues uh, or explains why this is so. Um, in, um, in malignancy or in cancer, uh, the first thing that the cell, uh, the reason why we get more, um, why we get cancer is because um, in the cell we have a regulatory system that tells the cell when it has to die. It's called apoptosis, it's programmed cellular death. And this is good news. You don't want the cell to be alive for hundreds years, you want every, you want renewal, you want new cells all the time. And this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this has been found from the cellular point of view to be crucial in um, oncogenesis, that the cells, that this mechanism uh, of apoptosis becomes disrupt disrupted somehow, so that the cell no longer dies, it multiplies, so instead of one new one, you have an old and a new one, and then this becomes more and more and more, and that's how tumors are grown. And uh, it has been shown that the um, activations of a cannabinoid receptor uh, strongly affect this apoptosis. It somehow, uh, all the molecules involved in this are naturally not yet clear, but it has been shown that it actually, uh, in cells that uh, have lost this mechanism of apoptosis, if, uh, if cannabinoid receptors are activated, the cells um, again activate the system of apoptosis and uh, finish the program uh, this, uh, program cellular death. So that's why we can see a decrease in tumors, because this uh, important um, cellular system becomes activated again once you activate the cannabinoid receptors. Okay, and now just um, to finish um, what I already started. So what the physiological roles and or the functioning of endocannabinoid system is, um, it is interesting uh, that it would be far easier to explain what the roles are not. Because uh, the list of what the roles in the body, what the endocannabinoid system does in the body, is really, really long. In fact, every system that um, scientists have studied thus far is affected by the endocannabinoid system. Not a single one has been found where the endocannabinoid system does not have an effect. Um, this is naturally because all the cells that we have in our bodies have these receptors. So changes naturally affect every cell, meaning every system. Um, but first, first and foremost, endocannabinoids are uh, neuromodulators. It means that when the endocannabinoids uh, are released or we um, ingest uh, phytocannabinoids, uh, it changes what uh, signaling molecules our neurons make. So different new, uh, some neurotransmitters get shut down, some get uh, uh, activated, uh, secondary messengers, uh, their concentrations change. Uh, so this is what we know for sure, that after uh, cannabinoid receptor activation, we have different, um, different neurotransmitters fire in our brains or in our neural system. Uh, the endocannabinoid system is an SOS mechanism in our body. This I already touched, but I find, find this to be really important that this is this is uh, this is a really important system that governs our stress response. Uh, so um, this is kind of a protection um, that our bodies have against excessive stress. So every time you have a really traumatic event, like a car crash or some other really um, traumatic or physically or emotional traumatic event, uh, a lot of endocannabinoids fire up and uh, our endocannabinoid system is really active. And what it tells the body to do is to rest, to eat, to sleep, to protect and to forget. Th that's how they explain amnesia when you have a really um, but say a car crash, majority of people don't remember events from a, for a certain period of, of time. That is because the 
endocannabinoid system, when it's overactive, it blocks the part of the brain which is responsible for short-term memory. Uh, it relaxes the entire nervous system and it promotes use, uh, 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 promotes uh, sleep. It induces uh, it induces the release of neurotransmitters that are really important for sleep. Um, so here, then there's just a list of um, processes or uh, happenings in our bodies that we know for sure that it affects. But as I already so it's memory for sure. And neurogenesis, this is what has been uh, uh, that is currently being studied really intensely. Um, this is, uh, uh, until recently, it was believed that neurons do not have the capacity to regenerate or multiply. It has been believed that neurons, once they're damaged, they cannot regrow. And it has been found that if you stimulate the endocannabinoid system, you definitely can have neurogenesis. This means that new neuronal cells start growing. And let's say you have an injury, you have a trauma in your head or in your spine. If you activate the endocannabinoid system, you can have new neuronal cells where it was previously believed that this is not possible. Then definitely in cognition, uh, it, the, the cannabinoid receptors are very... Uh, uh, strongly present in the centers of the brain um, that are responsible for cognition and motor control, appetite, pain, sensation, mood, burning, and blah blah blah. The list goes on and on and on. Um, um, it has recently been uh, uh, stated, as I already said before, that um, every single system in our body that we studied so far has been found to be affected by um, by endocannabinoid system. And this is naturally because of receptors. And um, the, uh, wherever we look, we see uh, effect of, uh, in all our internal organs, whether through CB1 receptors or through CB2 receptors. And um, at the end, um, I'm going to close my talk with uh, uh, the wisdom of the nature on uh, our bodies already know why they have receptors and why they have ligands and it's, uh, uh, it's good news that they have a way of finding each other ligands so cannabinoids and receptors and that our body knows exactly what to do with them so thank you for your <laughs> thank you very much Shana. you are amazing I think that you have some question here. Audience? Hello, uh, thanks for a very, very informative talk. Um, I got a few questions, um, which is, um, we hear a lot about for probably last um, few years, there's well, probably last 10, 15 years, the amount of research that's gone into the human genome system and how they're sequencing, and then they've said that recently they've found that they've actually been looking at the wrong part of the human genome system. There's a, there was a section that they've been ignoring. So I don't know what the exact terms for this are, but with regards to the research that's been gone in, um, what is the connection, if any, there must be between the human and genome system, uh, how they're mapping it, and the uh, CBD, uh, the cannabinoids uh, that you've told us about. And another question, quickly, is with regards to, um, um, in terms of, uh, it was alluded to yesterday, um, one, one of the speakers said about how cannabis uh, was relevant relevant parts of uh, Indian system of uh, medicine, Ayurvedic medicine. So I've um, done some training and some courses which is to do with natural medicine. But again, like your experience has been when you've asked questions or spoken to scientists about you should be doing this research, it's never really been um, pondered. So my experience again has been whether it's been about amongst CAM practitioners or natural medicine practitioners, everyone's to try to promote the herbal medicine, but one 
um, plant to medicine that's never really been grown upon at all has been the cannabis and then specifically the CBD. So is that, if that's something you can uh, go on uh, firstly with regards to the, um, the awareness of CBD in general practice and then secondly uh, with regards to the human genome and the cannabis method. Okay, how much time do we have? <laughs> okay, so yeah, uh, what we've been doing so far with the mapping is that uh, we okay. So what we we thought so far is that our genome has a coding regions and non-coding regions. So coding means that this part of the gene, of the DNA, produces a functional protein. And we thought that this bit is important, and the other one in between the next functional is not important. We even call it nonsense DNA. And uh, what we've done so far with uh, studying cannabinoids and receptors and uh, our genome is also that. We took receptors, we know which gene codes the receptors, we know which gene codes the endocannabinoids, and this is how far we've got. There's a whole science now concern, uh, that has found that these non-coding regions, this nonsense DNA, actually make a lot of sense. Probably more than the other ones. It's called epigenetics. It's a whole new field that uh, is now studying all the information that is stored in this non-coding sequence of DNA, but we're not re uh, we're not even close to saying what the effect it, the endocannabinoid system has on these parts, or what information it stores. We don't know even for all the other systems, let alone for this one that is lacking 20 years behind. So I can't really tell you, uh, but I can tell you for sure it has an effect. But I don't know which one. I, I'm not sure if anyone knows at this point. Okay, just quickly with regards to um, in, in natural medicine amongst the herbal practitioners, my experience has been, as I said, that, that no one's actually even entertaining any conversation on cannabis. Everyone's wanting to protect all the other herbs, but no one's actually talking about the most um, demonized herb for long, long people can imagine. Now here, um, I can tell you just this, that here the situation is more or less the same. Um, here uh, in Slovenia, even the science is more or less ignoring that. The, 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 the um, black market of this is growing, this is what is for sure, but nobody is controlling not the, the quality of, uh, of uh, herbal herbs and extracts and tinctures and things like that. Nobody is, uh, is concerned with dosage, nobody is doing anything. I, I have no idea why this is so. Um, but this is the situation we've seen also in Slovenia, the same. Thank you. But if you ever do find the reason, I want to know as well. Uh, hello. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, you told about the um, CBD that maybe we can find on hemp. Yes. And so, um, what would you say about hemp food? How hemp food could impact the endocannabinoid system? Is that, uh, you know, what, what is the hemp food made of? Is it made of seeds? Yeah, for example. Yeah. Well, it, it Eating hemp seeds. It's what it's made of. It doesn't, it's not all the same. So seeds uh, contain practically no cannabinoids, so they don't affect the endocannabinoids directly. But hemp seeds do contain a lot of omega-3, 6, and 9 fatty acids, which do make good precursors for synthesis of endocannabinoids. So from this point of view, it does something, but it doesn't, it doesn't directly activate the endocannabinoid system, but it makes a good pathway for it. it this is for seeds. But I have a short question. With respect to the phytocannabinoids, um, is cannabis the only plant which has that extract of any clinic or is there any research or has they found any other plant in the system that has such chemicals? Mm -hmm. 
there are few plants that have some cannabinoids, but none other plant has been found to contain this concentration of cannabinoids or this variety. Because to date, we have found 111 cannabinoids present in hemp, and I'm sure we're not done. So a few plants contain, let's say, a few of them, but not nearly as much. Or maybe we just don't know of it. But hemp is, to, to this point and to the knowledge that we have now, by far superior to other plants with respect to cannabinoids. Um, first of all, thank you, very informative. Um, I just wanted to ask, you said that THC binds to the CB1 and CB binds to the CB2 receptor, and that those are the only two that are found at the moment. Um, how is it with the other cannabinoids, CBN, CBV? Uh, can you maybe tell us a bit more how they maybe already bind, or how far the research is on, on those molecules? Well, we would have to be very specific because they're not all the same. Every cannabinoid has uh, uh, different receptors. So for a majority of cannabinoids, bind a certain affinity to CB1 and CB2 receptors. <laughs> but this depends on, uh, if you imagine that uh, the cannabinoid receptor and the cannabinoid bind, it's like, uh, uh, if you imagine a 3D molecule, they, they are structurally, they fit together. And it depends on how well they fit together. It depends on how much they activate this receptor. Of course, CB1 receptor is best activated by the strongest activation with THC and CB2 receptor with CBD. But also other cannabinoids bind these receptors with certain affinity. And with uh, the other cannabinoids, they found that they uh, activate many other receptors in the cell. There have been found at least 20 other receptors in other types of cell that other cannabinoids uh, that other cannabinoids activate. That the, this is why we expect to see uh, such very different uh, responses in our bodies and our physiology when using whole plant extract because they activate a variety of. Uh, Practically, there isn't a cell that has been studied that wouldn't activate at some point the cannabinoids. So, uh, but then if we want to know exactly to which receptor, we have to go cannabinoid by cannabinoid. It's very, it, there's nothing, generally you can't really say. But they, they bind some affinity to these two receptors for sure, and then every cannabinoid binds to other receptors, not connecting to endocannabinoid system completely other receptors and signaling pathways in the cell. Okay, thank you. Much success with your further research. Hi, um, I have a question regarding um, the CB1 receptor. We know that THC binds to CB1. What about the acidic versions? It's THCA, CBA. Both the same pathway? No. Um, I'm not sure if it, is, it has even been studied with, with, what kind, or with, with, with what kind of affinity they bind. We know for sure that they don't bind, bind in the same way. There's a possibility that it binds to some extent and does some activity, but by far not the same. Hi, thank you for this presentation. Um, I just want to ask you how much do you know about the decarboxylation? That's what he was asking, mm -hmm. how you, that you get from THC acid to THC. Yeah. And um, how, how important, uh, important would it be that people know about it? Because uh, when you eat the whole plant in a raw version, you don't get the THC that everybody is talking about. But people think that you're going to die if you eat like a lot of cannabis. That is the same that if you would smoke the same amount of cannabis. Mm. But if you would eat it, you, you I think, can you explain this? Okay. What is decarboxylation actually? That? Uh, decarboxylation is a process where a certain functional chemical group gets uh, 
dislocated from the molecule itself. And it changes its chemical properties and 3D structure and binding capacity. But um, this is, um, this is again not a very one-sided um, question. So uh, the carboxylation happens naturally. If you dry, uh, if you dry um, cannab uh, cannabis, you get natural slow decarboxylation. A very rapid decarboxylation happens when you heat it up. So if you smoke it or if you extract it at high temperatures, and uh, you don't have uh, and sunlight that also does the carboxylation, but also rather slow. So this is naturally happening. You, it depends uh, what you want with it, and uh, it depends on uh, when, what kind of, let's say, if you use, if you have a raw, just harvested hemp, you can have tons of THC in it, but you will not get practically zero psychotropic effects because it doesn't bind to the same affinity to PA, the CB1 receptor, and it doesn't cause these effects. So from this point of view, you could eat the whole field and not. Uh, but um, this is uh, here with carboxylation. It's also the, it just depends what you want in your body. Which system do you want to activate? For certain uh, processes in our body and certain conditions, it's very important to stimulate CB1 receptors. But for others, you rather wouldn't. You know? For some processes, it's important to leave the CB1 receptors uh, uh, at most a little bit activated, but you just want the CB2 receptor. So it de um, from this point, it depends what you want to do with your system and what you want to change. But from the point of view of safety, uh, if you have freshly cut, everything is uh, majority, so 99.5% is uh, carboxylated, and it will not cause any practically any uh, psychotropic effects. Enough? One more, mm -hmm. one more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the nice reaction. Um, I'm interested, uh, why would you think that um, a synthetic mo molecule, molecule that is completely identical to a natural molecule wouldn't be that efficient? Oh, thank you for the question. I think I can Yeah. So, so first of all, uh, okay. Uh, if we're talking about synthetic molecules, now you have to imagine that you have to go into a lab or you have to uh, be very strict about the whole process. And if you're really, really, really lucky with synthetic molecules, and if you're using it, you will get just one molecule. If you're less lucky, you will get a hundred more that you definitely don't want. To Let's say that it's uh, like 99 okay. point blah, blah, blah. 999, two. and then you can. Oh, and then. So if you, can ima if you imagine uh, how our endocannabinoid system functions, and that it's really complex, and that uh, if you take just, let's say, you just get a synthetic THC or CBD, you will get, you will, you will bind, uh, it will bind to one receptor, either CBD or uh, CB1 or CB2, and it will do something. It will cause a reaction in the body. Uh, but it's completely not comparable in any way. This is like, if you can imagine, you, if you have just one drum, so you just bang one drum, you get something, you hear something. But if you have a natural extract from a whole plant where you have at least 110 cannabinoids, at least uh, 120 uh, terpenes, at least God knows how many flavonoids, and vitamins, minerals, uh, uh, phytochemicals. You have at least 500 compounds that are exactly in the right uh, proportions with each other. They won't activate just one receptor. They will activate a cascade of re receptors in the body. And if we know that the endocannabinoid system is aimed at maintaining homeostasis in the body, you can know for sure that the reaction in the body will be towards homeostasis, towards health. So this is like a symphony comparing to beating up one drum. Um, don't you think that uh, by using all together we we'll never know the exact effect of a single molecule? Um, well, we, we, we've already synthesized them. We already know for some 
uh, what they do. But um, it has been the same case with many natural substances. The same case has been... Yeah, and it has been the, the same with, let's say, cinnamon. They found three active substances. They isolated all of them. They chemically synthesized all of them. They gave them to patients. Uh, they did clinical trials. They never got even the closest effects to when they are together. So there's a... Um, I understand your question, and from a scientific point, it makes perfect sense. But I'm afraid our bodies and na nature just isn't made that way. We have to, it would be a good idea to kind of widen our horizons and just accept that maybe, if, even if we don't know every detail and we see it functioning really well, that maybe it's worth to look further in that direction as well. Yes, of course, it, uh, it could work. But, um I mean, hemp was not like made for our system. It was made for itself. So maybe, maybe we can extract some more functions from the single molecules if we look at them. Of course, it's great if it works, but just for the scientific purposes. Also. Yeah, sure. Thank I would you. love to dissect every bit of it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to end the question because this is the call from the California Cannabis Ministry is waiting for us. Thank you very much, Tanya. You are amazing. You work and work and work. Then we will get some special innovations here. Not only in Slovenia, but global. Thank you very much. So, uh, we will take a uh, five-minute break. Uh, California, wait for us online.